Mark Kasiba, what's up? Hey, man. How you doing? Good. Long time no see. Joe yeah. Reese. <laughs> yeah, so we go way back uh, to the uh, Skull Candy days. You used to be my boss, actually. So, oh. and we kept in touch all these years. Um, and uh, wanted to have you on. You've, we, we've had some discussions and some uh, lunches in the pre COVID times, uh, you know, about some. Uh, I guess this business framework you've been thinking of uh, over the years. And you know, I look back on our discussions from last year and I, and I, and I still think a lot about them. I think you, you hit on something that was uh, fairly, um, it was just, it was just a, a different way of thinking about business and operations. Uh, and I kind of wanted to uh, talk to you more about that. So yeah. Shoot. Yeah. what do you got? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, why don't you uh, tell people a little bit about yourself and who you are? So um, I'm a uh, I'm an old dude with three daughters. Uh, I am I'm an industrial engineer who started my career at big companies like Ford and and Lucent Bell Labs um, and and other huge companies, and then got on the startup thing. Um, in my career, I wanted to, um, I, early on, I, I didn't want to be an expert at one thing. I wanted the breadth because I didn't think I was ever good at one of the disciplines in, in supply chain or operations. So <clears throat> in my 20s and 30s, I took uh, horizontal job assignments to learn the breadth of it. And I wanted, working for the man at big companies, I, I, I wanted the opportunity to um, build my own supply chain, build my own operation. So in 08, um, I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Uh, we were living in, in Georgia of all places and we moved to Utah and we took the Skull Candy gig, which was a small startup that wasn't gonna last. We rented a house cause we didn't even think it would last that long. Um, and Skull Candy headphones uh, uh, exploded with an IPO and then it collapsed. But um, the cool thing about Skull Candy was the guy I was working for, a guy named Jeremy Andrus, who people know uh, in the community, um, uh, super bright guy, Harvard MBA. Um, he didn't understand what I did, though. And so he, when I was interviewing him for the job to hire me in, and I kind of like flipped that around, um, I knew that he didn't understand it. And I also knew he was uh, brilliant and smart enough to let me do my own thing. So the cool thing about Skull Candy is I had a blank slate to build it my way. So instead of working for a Ford Motor Company where there's buildings that do these different things, I had the ability to have a blank piece of paper. So um, I built the supply chain there, um, built it for an IPO, which has to be very, very data intensive and predictable. We did that. Um, Jeremy left and I left and we went to a company called Traeger, uh, Wood Pellet Grills. Uh, and we did that for five years. That was a rocket ship of, of it. The, the business just exploded. I won't go through the numbers, but it was a huge multiple of invested capital for the investors. Um, and after that, I kind of like was disjointed with my, my kids. I didn't feel like I was being a good dad. So I've kind of just stopped. And, and so for the last year and a half, I bought a lake house in New Hampshire, I uh, spent summers there with my kids on a boat. And, and since they're teenagers, I realized that all I really do now is annoy the shit out of my kids. So, uh, but that, that kind of takes you to where I am now, but I dabble and help uh, some really interesting companies that I like uh, if, if people call me and, and have questions and, and uh, it's kind of, uh, I can, I feel like I can see the whole field to do a quarterback reference, an old quarterback reference. I can see the whole field and the field moves slowly. Um, but uh, from a data perspective, um, the cool thing I learned when I was 25 years old right out of college at Ford was um, my brain gravitated to data. Data made sense to me. And what I realized is data was the source of power for a young man that I was, um, that you could ask me anything about my business and I would have at least the ability to show you information in a way that answered your question. And and. My, my power curve as a young person in meetings with very important people um, uh, kind of accelerated because I knew my shit because I knew the data. And so whenever there was a meetings that were driven through emotion and feelings, I would be able to say, but the, there, but the answer is 42%. 
that's what the data shows. And it got, it really changed how people viewed me and gave me this life. Data is inherent to me, but it also gave me this uh, lifelong uh, quest to, to understand and mine this data in a way that gave me power as a young man and then results as an old person when I'm trying to drive business. business. That was a long tangent. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you mentioned being able to see the field uh, in, in slow motion, like walk me through that. Like when, when you walk into a company now, what are, what are some things that you see uh, playing out? Yeah, that maybe you maybe your younger version didn't see. You know, it's th- there's something super cool about getting old. Besides getting up a couple times a night to take a piss, um, uh, but getting old is is you get this wisdom around sorting out what's important, and what's not important, and and you know if you're a data guy, Joe, um, the Pareto uh, uh, Pareto analysis, right? The eighty twenty rule just rules your life. And in business, there's so much noise, and there's so much. Uh, uh, there can be so much emotion and noise and, and things around business and worry about competition. But if you break down what business is really about, it's just a handful of things. And within that, those things, there's a handful of, of, of main categories. And then there's just a stack of levers, just levers you have to measure and flip to drive a business. And, um, so what, what wisdom gives you is this ability to cut through the, the stuff that doesn't really matter and really focus on the things that create value for a business. And if your goal is to be a startup and have the small little thing and grow it so it generates wealth for you or whatever, um, or to, to pop it like we've done in these last two businesses, a group of us ha- has done, um, it, it, it's, it's it just is, it's, a, it's simple. It's textbook. And we would say this at Trigger all the time. This is textbook. Anything I'm going to teach you is in a textbook, but you've forgotten to pull the textbook back out. And that's what makes the field move slowly. That's what that's that allows you to see the whole field and have it slow down is you, you're not worrying about that, that uh, blitzing linebacker because you know you have protection on that side because that doesn't matter. It may matter later, but right now, this is what matters. This is the 80-20 rule. This is the Pareto of business. And it's, it's kind of cool to have gone through that journey to have that, that knowledge. Interesting. Uh, you know, so I remember in our uh, discussion, our lunch discussion uh, last year, I mean, you're talking about um, uh, some things like operating disciplines. Is this what you're referring to uh, yeah. in, in this case? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, if, and you learn this and, and what I'm talking about, isn't um, necessarily a software app, a business, I'm a consumer products guy. So what I, where I'm talking about businesses, you have an idea, you make a product, you sell the product, the person loves the product and wants to buy it again and more that sort of stuff. Uh, so, but, but their basics. And again, it's textbook. You got uh, revenue, gross margin, cash and EBIT. Those are the four things. EBIT matters because that's the multiplier of the value of your business. If you have a growing great business, venture capital is going to pay the kind of business seven to 15 times a multiplier of EBIT. Um, and, and EBIT's the output of revenue uh, and gross margin. Um, then you have brand. If, if you're a branded product, if you want to build a brand, brand is another one of these operating disciplines. You have um, a, a product, a, a understanding of what product does and how it works and what problem it's solving. Um, and then you have customer. And so these are, you know, who is your customer? How are they performing? So if you, if you have control and, and data around and levers around revenue, gross margin and EBIT, um, and that generates cash, which keeps businesses in business. Small companies are always ch- chasing the ability to have enough cash um, and, and they're either diluting their company by investors or they're borrowing at a high rate. And you have some uh, uh, control of brand, product and customer. Ooh, I'm sorry. The other one I, for, I left out was culture, the culture of your business, the, your employees, how are your employees doing? How's the vibe in the business? How are they performing to their career development? So those are the eight things that kind of I've discovered matter. I would, you know, I would say having worked at Skull Candy with you and, and, you know, knowing people that work at Traeger, I would say that, you know, you mentioned like textbook. Um, 
for example, and and playbooks. And, and it's like Traeger, at least from my view, is basically Skull Candy 2.0 or, or 3.0, maybe if you include stance in that picture. But it's like you guys basically did some, you had something really working really well at Skull Candy um, from a culture and customer brand standpoint and really, um, I think, took it to the next level with Traeger. I don't know what your thoughts on that are, but. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. It, the, 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 the awesome operating disciplines are how, how to take business and make it worth, if it's worth 5 million, I can make it worth 500 million through those things. Um, the, the, the other things that you're talking about is, is how do you pick the next business? And so um, the difference between Skullcandy and Traeger for us, the main difference was this, this lack of barrier to entry. You know, the, 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 anybody can make a headphone and, and, and Skullcandy had this great brand, but this, this, this problem around anybody could rip it off. And, and Traeger, you know, to control fire with oxygen and wood is kind of hard. And there is a real science behind it. Um, and that was a cool barrier. And then we did some IP around it to protect it. But from, from an operating discipline, it's kind of interesting. We took skull candy and we stripped it down. We, I had less employees, although the business was worth quadruple what it was. So we, we five of us who started it, and that's Dalen Bushman, uh, Don Blazel, Jeremy Andrus, Denny Bruce, and I. Those are five guys from from Skull Candy who kind of went over there, and then Gebert and other people joined us after. Uh, but um, I think what we did was we 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 cut away a lot of the noise. A big step we did was there were things we were doing at, at Skull Candy that that didn't matter. That was, um, uh, it was, it was too much. And so we tried to do it in, in a, in a, in a cleaner way, in a, in a, in a, in a cleaner and le- with less people with more focus on the priorities. And I think that's where the operating disciplines really came in. And we really focused on revenue, gross margin, EBIT and cash. And then the other stuff kind of just fell, fell in line. I suppose with the operating disciplines, uh, how much of uh, Traeger not being a public company uh, factored into your ability to really scale back um, and focus on the 100%. things that you thought mattered? Yeah, so, you know, we 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 I made the we made the greatest SNOP process in the world at Skull Candy, and it was the ability to forecast not revenue but gross margin. Um, and, and ultimately EBIT. And, and that's really impossible to do. Um, and we did it because we were going to go public. And so there's a whole bunch of effort and, and stuff you got to put around that sort of business to do that. You, you get pun, pen, pun, punished or, or rewarded for predictability in public markets. In private markets, you have the ability to do it a little bit looser in a much, much more wholesome <laughs> healthy environment in, in private markets. Um, so definitely that was, that's a good observation that that made it, that, that was a big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, I definitely recall some, some contortions just to, you know, um, yeah, just to appease the, uh, the, the public markets that I know myself running a, a private company now that I just wouldn't have to put myself into, you know, those situations just because it's like, why? Public markets are suckers. <laughs> public markets are suckers. And, 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 and the data shows public markets, people going public has crashed in the last 20 years. It's just insane how the appetite for it has gone away and, and the power of private equity and venture capital funds that has skyrocketed, um, which is kind of unfair because normal people uh, can't invest in private equity as easily as in the market. And so private, company, private companies just operate better than public, mm-hmm. public companies. Yeah. It's interesting. And then, you know, in, in the operating disciplines, I mean, you kind of mentioned uh, levers. You want to dive into that? Like, what, so, what do you so, mean by levers? So, so let, let's, you know, you, you have this discipline of revenue and, and you put effort around, as an example, um, or, or gross margin, and you put effort around understanding what it is, measuring it, understanding it, slicing it into a whole bunch of different ways to really understand the data and, and get to the whys. You know, the, 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 the Six Sigma five whys, is, it, it still is used every day for, for people who do what we do. Um, and, and so you create processes around these, le- these levers or these, these disciplines. And then underneath it, there are things that you need to measure in order to understand where, where, where it falls. And then there are 180 or 400, and I have a whole list. I, I've been documenting all my stuff I've done uh, 
since I've left. And, and you have 150 levers of things to consider around things to look at and to measure. And, and so depending on this, where you are in the Pareto of your business in the early stages, you're not worried about return rates because you have to worry about shipping first. You can't get a return if you can't ship. And so you have these priorities, but you have these levers and, and ultimately what data is, is data is the ability to measure something, establish a target, uh, a reasonable target, assign a, a human or a person, sorry, mach machine learning AI, um, uh, but a person to look at it, understand the whys, and then act Data without action is just worthless. And I'm not talking autonomous vehicles and, 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 and the, the enormous amount of data it would take just to, to, to maintain a lot, you know, are, am I on the road or not? I'm talking about data where you're, you're building a product and you're shipping it. And so where, where people get lost is they, have, they, get, they get buried by the data. They can't see the whole field so they can't prioritize what's important now what's the important lever and they don't set a target of like what should it be and then they don't assign a human being to owning it and then they don't give that person a date of when you're going to make a decision and act and the great thing about data is and, and forecasting you could kind of see the future and it doesn't matter what you decide if you act and you're wrong that's okay because we're monitoring the data and we're going to readjust it if we're wrong but you have to act you have to be somebody who says this does not look right it should be this i think this is why from what we can tell i think this is why because it's not always absolute i think this is why so i'm going to act differently and that action is a lever and that lever is something that we say great come back in three weeks or three days and tell me what that action has done. And if it's the wrong action, then flip it back. And so it's a series of, of surrounding yourself with really good people, an enormous amount of data that gets filtered into a Pareto of the things that really matter, the levers that really matter, and then assign it to a human being and saying, we're all in this together. And the cool thing about that is you're unified in this business from the upper levels to the lower levels that we all see it this way and we can have disagreements, but today we think it's this and this is how we're going to act as a business. And if we're wrong, we're all wrong. I mean, the, 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 the classic call is when, when COVID hit in China, everyone stopped ordering. No one would have predicted the, the, the whipsaw that happened, but you know, and I'm not trigger anymore. I'm assuming that trigger when they lowered that forecast and they, they said, Hey, Oh God, this is going to be horrible. We, they couldn't see, and I don't know this for a fact cause I'm not there. They couldn't see that, that, that home Depot is going to be open and, and uh, demand for outdoor grilling is going to go through the roof. They couldn't have seen that, but when they made the decision to pull back the forecast, which I'm assuming that they did, that they all did it together. So no one's at fault. We're, we all made that mistake. And then we monitor and adjust it and adjust it and adjust it. And so that's what it unifies the business. It creates great accountability. Everyone's on the same playing field. And it's a group decision, not always a group decision, but it's, it's a group uh, uh, accountability if we're right or we're wrong. Who, who ultimately is in charge of that accountability if you're, if you're to name like a role or a, or a person at a company? Well, it depends. You know, one of the interesting things about companies is they create a data guy who works for the IT department. And we never did that. I, I wanted spies in every department. So I would hire a, a young person who's really good with data. I'd say you have four weeks to learn SQL back in the day and you got to mine this data and solve these problems. And then you, cult you cultivate that young person or old person who's who resonates and gets really good at it. You go, okay, now your job is you got to train three more people. And one of them has to be in the quality department because they don't have anybody. And one of them has to be in the sales department. And if you kind of think back at what we did at Skull Candy, we created this, this podge of these, these great people with, with real data skills, the Nick Petersons and the Brent Phillips, if you remember some names, and then they went off into their other areas and they became a little data disease into the, into their own area. And so I don't, I don't think there's a, a, a person who's all 
getting data accurate, cleaned up, and available is a utility. It's water. It's hard work in the beginning, but once the data is there and it's clean, it's water. Like I, I don't, I don't have to test my water to see if it's potable every week to drink. Um, but once the data is there, the data is the data. And so that, that section of getting the data available is a person. But then I think it's spread to hiring a cultural filter of hiring people who resonate with that data and creating little pockets that create a cross-company competency on the comfort of looking at data and, and understanding data and making database decisions. Yeah, that's interesting. And then supply chain is an interesting one too, because I, I would think that, uh, I know in my experience, supply chain is one of the more data dependent fields. Uh, for example, your, your suppliers, what's the first thing they ask you for besides a, an order? Um, yeah. Forecast, right? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so they know what they can buy. And then obviously they, they give that forecast and edit it and give it to their suppliers and so forth, yep. right? And so, you know, maybe on the notion of, of what happened with COVID and, and forecasting and um, like, how would you build resiliency uh, in the supply chain so you could deal with the, the shocks that, that something like COVID or even the financial crisis brought yeah. way back in the day? I, I think I the, uh, the financial crisis or COVID, um, it's funny because the financial crisis didn't hit Skull Candy at all. <laughs> you know, for some right. reason, we, we, we slingshotted through that. But um, uh, I think that's a once in a lifetime, uh, to be honest, it's a five times in a career uh, these events have happened to me. And we've had other elements of this before with the internet bubble and then 9 11 and the oil cra crash and the home crash. All these things just kind of, kind of happen. I, I think what happens is you don't create a supply chain or a forecasting process around the anomalies. Um, but what you do is you create a forecasting process around the unity and the cadence of a business. And I would argue that forecast accuracy matters. And, and I, I'll tell you why it matters in a second, but not for why you think it does. And, and, and forecast accuracy, if you were to ask me what forecast accuracy at any of the, my businesses, I wouldn't have a number for you because it really doesn't matter that much um, to the main reason it matters, which is you get a forecast wrong, you have too much inventory or not enough inventory. But if you get a forecast process right and it's unified at the top of the company with, with the CEO and the C-levels and the VPs and the directors to, to the uh, individual co co contributors who actually do the work, you get, you get a, a, a message of saying, this is where we think the future is going to be. And here's it's three pages. Here's the forecast over time. And you can see some things. And then here's two more pages. Here's everything in the forecast that has risk from the top dollar to the bottom. And this, this, in this forecast, these are the 17 things that we don't know is going to happen. We don't know if we're going to come out of this recession we, or, or it could be a, the value of the dollar. It's these seven things in the forecast are the top risk in the forecast and the next page are these are the 14 things that are not in the forecast that could go into the forecast and in each one of them sorted from top dollar down is a person's name and this person owns this and so it aligns focus that if you're going to be as a C-level focus on anything, take the top three of those things because there's seven, it's seven million dollars of for, in forecast risk. And these top three are nine million dollars of out of forecast opportunities. And we want to talk about that every day. And we want to have conversations about it. And we do this every month, every month, every month. It's a cadence, it's the heartbeat of the business. And so that forecast accuracy, these sorts of conversations become unifying throughout the organization. And, and I use the phrase one forecast to rule them all, not to be a nerd, but, but it's like the ring. There's only one forecast. So finance doesn't make their own forecast. Sales doesn't have their own forecast. Ops doesn't have their own forecast. And so we're all marching to the same thing. And what we do is say, I think I see this. 
and Larry owns it, making up a guy named Larry. Larry owns it. Larry, what do you see? He goes, I see this. It could be this, this, this. Jeremy, what do you think? Jenny, what do you think? And you get these minds together and go, let's do this. Are we in agreement? Makes sense. But then we come back and revisit it. And so that's sort of always looking at that critical lead time at lead time, forecast at lead time, when I have to place an order. Forecast error next month doesn't matter because I can't, I can't, it's, it's three months to get the product. So it doesn't matter that that sort of behavior allowed Traeger to grow into a monster, allowed Skull Candy to grow into a monster. It's that unified uh, behavior. Now around that, if it, what you do is you have forecasts, you have something around inventory and inventory is cash and companies that are small and growing run out of cash. You're, you're a $3 million business. You're, you're chasing cash constantly. You have something in the middle called safety stock formula and that is lead time, lead time variation and forecast accuracy and service levels. And those four magic numbers create how much safety stock you have. And that is the more important thing to do that's not done in this meeting because we're already handling the forecast error. But we also have a team doing lead time and lead time variation to, to get that inventory level. So I would argue that the forecast error that, you would, that COVID created was so substantial that your safety stock error couldn't have ever caught it. And it was just, it yeah. was, and, and, and as long as you admit that, then, then we're going to be out of product or we're going to have excess product. But in a typical steady state world, which we normally live, that the better the forecast, the less variation and the lower the lead time from, from your manufacturers, the less inventory. And so when Traeger would grow, we would grow and Skull Candy, the business grew 40%, but inventory dropped 60% because we were getting so much better at managing lead time, lead time variation and forecast accuracy by understanding those things that we had, to, we, we could do it with less inventory and generate a shit ton more ca cash, which we get rewarded for. Mm -hmm. Right. Another yeah, I mean, it's, no, no, it's, it's a, it's a good approach. And it's one that I, I, I don't see a lot. I mean, I see quite a few companies doing uh, some variation of SNOP, for example, but you know, that's, sales and operations planning, right? That, that, but that's, but I think what you extended was uh, taking that approach and making it company wide. Uh, for example, Skull Candy was very marketing driven as well. It's a, mm -hmm. a consumer brand and I, I'd say some of the, you know, um, at the time, some of the best consumer marketing out there, in my opinion, was what Skull Candy was doing um, very, on its various fronts. And it's just, it's really hard to capture um, those activities, for example, and, and get people on board and say other departments besides sales and ops. But I think you did a really good job at um, taking a holistic view of the business, right? So, so this is what everyone who touched the business touches revenue. And so if you have yeah. marketing and you're saying we have four marketing campaigns and the, and the sales guys or the ops guy don't know you're doing that, then you're going to miss it. And so, so just simply having a, a, a marketing calendar and then turning and say, hey, how much are you spending on this? We're spending $50,000. What do you think the return is? Oh, that's very hard to do. It's like, is it up or is it down? Are you, you know, and, and just kind of pushing the questions at least made us all, you know, the one thing that, that, that Skull Kenny did when I was there and Trigger does, did, does still today, I, I, I believe, um, is uh, there's an agreement there's, there's connect connectivity across departments. This is, we are going to win and we're all winning together and it goes through revenue. That's the tip of the spear. And this is, this is the world of what we know the risk and opportunities of this business are in this one page document. And if you, the attendance in SMOP was insane, it was the CEO's favorite uh, uh, meeting. And you'd go in for three hours or two and a half hours and you would leave and you would know everything about the business, all the risk and opportunity. So um, it was a value. And so that's why it kind of stuck. So it's interesting in, in the data science world now, what I see is um, there's a lot more attention on um, new approaches to time series forecasting. Um, and, and I think what I'm also seeing are a lot of data scientists taking an interest in things like supply chain and demand planning, for example. I mean, what are your thoughts on um, maybe somebody 
or what, maybe what's some advice for somebody getting into demand planning these days? Uh, what are some skills that maybe um, a good demand planner should have? The, the demand planners are hard to find because they're the artist of the operation because there's nuance to it and there's gut feel to it. And there's, there's some um, uh, pattern recognition that you get over a, a period of time. Um, uh, we, we had, um, um, we've had some amazing people who've gone through the journey, but some, some, and I have a whole, I have a 62 levers around this, around the things that are important, but I'll throw a couple of them out. Um, you need to speak two languages as a demand planner. When you face salespeople, they talk revenue. And when you face factories, they talk units. And so you're constantly doing the translation between languages that sales people, how they speak, and factories and how they speak. Now, with the salespeople, you ha- they don't want to do it. They're not driven to download information from in, in, in a manner from sales, but or in a language, they, they, they want to, they want to talk. They don't want to, they don't want to get, go into an Excel spreadsheet. So you, you handhold them through the process and you talk in their language. You, you feed them huge amounts of information. Like, did you know blue has been blue colored X, Y, and Z is on fire in the last six months? They go, I didn't know blue. Did you know that Tom over there in the other region is selling this product 10 times more and you're not selling any of them. He goes, I didn't know that. So you're, you, you have a conversation for the people who are engaged, who want to, you're trying to extract these golden nuggets of information from in a way that, that's, that, that, that um, uh, they understand, they're comfortable talking with, and they're able to download from their brain. And it's a very hard thing to do. We have a guy named Dustin Joyce, uh, who's at Traeger and he's running the department now. He was one of the best I've ever seen. And and where his real he, he his skill set was in un, being able to really understand the products and really understand the salespeople uh, with with a, a, a solid uh, uh, skill set in Excel and basic data stuff. But he wasn't picking a, 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 a seasonal pattern X Y and Z binomial normal distribution, all the different ones. He was trying to get the information to, to actually pick a number at that critical uh, forecast at lead time. And, and he was, he is, he, he's so talented in his ability to sit with a salesperson and have a conversation like we're having now and just pick up the little nuggets and get it down on paper. So it's very hard. Demand planning is very hard. And, and so beyond the ability once you have the historical number to look for trends, if you are in if you are in P and G Procter and Gamble and you have fifteen years of history on this one product, then that data scientist is different than somebody who's an entrepreneur in a business that's on fire because you can't use historical. We grew a business seventy five percent that year. That's an anomaly. That's never happened in the history. If I forecasted what was going to happen in history, I would have missed that seventy five percent. Sales guy knew, and and people like Dustin w- have been able to just extract that from these salespeople, and the salespeople love him. They wanted to engage because they know if they get this right, they get more accurate inventory, and they get better they get better supply. That's interesting, and, and I guess on that note too, what what are your thoughts on uh, holding salespeople accountable for their forecasts? Sales, sales owns the forecast. They do. Um, if they get the forecast wrong, they have excess inventory and they own it. Their name's on it. They have to deal with it. If they get the uh, wrong the other direction, they're out of supply, it shut the F up. Hey, you didn't forecast it. Or, and if they get it wrong and the other guy gets it right, right I'm not stealing his inventory. You got the forecast. You get this inventory. So it creates this accountability. So salespeople own the forecast and controversially, they own the inventory because they forecasted it. And that only is true as if ops builds exactly what they forecast. And we don't say, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm going to build less or I'm going to build more. We build their forecast. 
So if sales truly owns the forecast and we provide the forecast for them, we do the analytics, we get it ready and put in a little bowl, a bow with a bow on top. We say, this is what we think happened. We have nine questions for you in these two hours we're doing this collaboration. What's this? What's this? What's this? Why is this this? What's this? What's this? And, and, and we're adjusting. And then we finalize and say, this is what you're saying. This is what we're going to do, right? And they say, yes. And that's what we run with and go. So if sales owns the forecast, is accountable for the forecast, and they own the inventory, then they have skin in the game to get it right. And so that, that, that mind shift is very hard for people. People, salespeople, well, I don't own the forecast. That's an operating product. That's not me. I'm not a forecaster. But they're the ones who have met with a the customer. They've been at events. They know that this problem product is working or not. They have the, they're the, they're the forefront of the whole business. And then I guess, what do you think the interplay should be between marketing and sales? I mean, this is a constant tension in a lot of businesses. Um, but if marketing is driving leads and, and salespeople are selling product, I mean, what, what's the uh, correct way that these two uh, um, should interact, you think? The, something called the triad, okay? So you got sales, marketing, and product. And so if sales and marketing or product are working with a customer in the middle, if they're working together, then the product is the product that sales wants. The marketing message fits the product that sales is selling and you have unity of mission. What you get is when you have problems and you see like the marketing and sales aren't talking is because the triad isn't working. And sometimes that just takes a strong dominant uh, leader who is, who is unifying those and telling people to cut the shit and, and focus on doing what's right for the business. Denny Bruce, obvious guy from uh, uh, who, who was at Skullcandy is now at Triggers, the best in the business. And, and his ability to create unity across those things makes all of the messaging and everything, not to say there's not push and pull on these sorts of things, but it's, it's, it is the triad, prod, head of product, head of sales, and head of marketing are a team focusing on that customer and that revenue. <clears throat> That's interesting. Um, so kind of wrapping up a bit, I mean, what are, what are some other things that I guess were uh, big revelations to you, um, you know, along your journey for like the past 10 years that we haven't talked about? Um, you know, uh, to be philosophical stuff, you know, the, the, when you look back at your career or any particular job, any problem you have in your inbox right now, no one gives a shit. You won't even remember it. It's, it's two things. It's what have you learned? How did you improve yourself in this time that you were given on earth? And, and that's like, I've learned the skill. I've become, uh, I've always wanted to be the best at something or I wanted to be the best carpenter, finished carpenter, you know, in, in the area because people like that guy, that guy's done something. And I, and I, I tried to be really, really good at, at, at this thing that I chose. Um, so working in any job you get, when you look back, if you become a lot better at something, it's incredibly satisfying. It's incredibly satisfying. The second thing is relationships and, and your friends and the people you really look back and with fondness and, and those, those trips you've taken to China with those people on those crazy you, trips that you get stuck in airports, that stuff you will never forget. So become really, really good at something um, and, and, and help people to become great at something, helping developing people's careers. So deeply satisfying. Um, uh, th those, those two things and the people, those two things are the things that resonate when you look back at a career and, um, any problem you have, anything that you're worried, anything that keeps you up tonight is not touching those two things. It's just noise. You won't even remember it. So don't stress about it. <laughs> That's so damn awesome. Totally agree. Yeah. That's, uh, I think, I think I'm finally starting to realize a lot of those things, uh, especially the inbox thing that you, uh, you mentioned, um, a lot of it's noise and bullshit. So that's awesome, dude. Cool. Um, I guess if anyone wants to uh, learn more about you, how would they? Uh, how would they get a hold of you or uh, find out more? I've kept my Hotmail account forever. I'm only, I'm only upset that it's not AOL.com, 
but it's Mark Kosiba at hotmail.com. I can't give it up now. It's too glorious. Um, uh, or uh, hit me up on LinkedIn and, 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 and listen, I'm willing to help. If anyone wants to take a call and walk through this stuff, um, uh, I, I, I'm enjoying this part of my life right now where um, I don't have skin, skin in the game where I was like deep anxiety. Like we're going to mess this thing up and my family's not going to eat to, uh, to a more uh, uh, teacher sort of thing. So if anybody has any, anybody wants to reach out, please feel free to reach out. I can vouch for that. I, I consider you the, uh, you know, one of the Yodas that I know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, if, if, if you need, uh, if you need help and, and supply chain or otherwise, I'm Marsh, you guys. So cool. Well, thanks, Mark. It's been good chat right, as always. So yeah, yeah. I'll talk to you.